Mr. Mayor, we are now live. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome you to this uh, Committee of the Whole. It's a combined meeting of both um, operations and administration and community development because we had some thin agendas for this month. So please rise if you're able for the reading of the invocation. Okay. As we come together today, we recognize the great responsibilities laid upon us. Our council will always strive to understand the needs of the people we serve and to use power wisely and well. Our purpose is to establish and maintain a city of prosperity and righteousness where freedom prevails and where justice rules. Let us also not forget those who've served our community and who are no longer with us so we continue to do the work we must in their memory. Please be seated. So members of the committee, I'm going to formally introduce, I think I'll start to do this, uh, the staff that are helping us each evening because it does change in the clerk's office. Uh, so tonight we have Julia Sippel, who is our uh, clerk this evening. Where, where are you, Julia? There you are. <clears throat> and she has assistance tonight from Jennifer Page. Where's Jennifer? Jennifer, you're too shy to show up. <laughs> Hello. There you are. Jennifer actually helped me through the summer. Good to see you, Jennifer. So I'd like to uh, remind members of the committee, this is almost by rote now, and the viewing public that there are a few procedural rules that apply because of course we're doing this virtually and we'll likely be continue to do that for quite some period of time. So all members uh, shall remain muted to reduce feedback all web cameras for members of council shall remain turned on during the course of the meeting so that you continue to count for quorum. Staff will be requested to join the video meeting should the need arise to answer questions that members of council have. Any member of council should indicate they wish to speak by, of course, pushing the raised hand button in the participant box. Clerk staff will lower your hand when you begin speaking. In the event that we experience a connection or service interruption that affects quorum, we will um, uh, recess the mini meeting for up to 15 minutes to regain quorum. If quorum is not achieved within 15 minutes, the meeting will be adjourned automatically. All members of the committee participating via online, online video conference will vote using the eScribe voting system and the clerk will announce the vote results. Members of the public who have registered as delegates or under the statutory public hearings are now able to take part electronically via webcam or via telephone for the meetings. All rules for delegations under the city's procedural rules bylaw continue to apply. Prior to starting, I'd like to inform members that a new executive summary has been added to all reports coming forward from staff as well. Full copies of bylaws will be appended, attached to the city council meeting, agendas in the bylaw. Uh, staff have worked diligently on these initiatives, which is the purpose of which is to provide uh, additional information to members of the public that like to view and see what we're doing and obviously increase transparency for all. So we have a fairly long agenda night. So do, are there any members of the committee that wish to or need to make a declaration of a pecuniary interest? If you have to do that, physically raise your hand. I'll recognize you and you can state your conflict. Sorry, Mayor Davis, um, yes. we, we did not take roll call. Oh, well, let's take roll call then. Thank you. That's why we, that's why I thought I'd better show Julia so she can correct my mistakes. Go ahead, Julia. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Utley? Present. Councillor Martin? Here. Councillor McCreary? Here. Councillor Sless? Present. Councillor Wall? Present. Councillor Antosky? Here. Councillor Van Tilborg? Here. Councillor Carpenter? Here. Councillor Weaver? Present. Mayor Davis? I'm present. Thank you. So now that we've got that out of the way, um, before I uh, ask members to their request for separation of the items, I'm going to make a few comments and having to do with 
today's events, in particular, the provincial announcement of a, of a full lockdown. And, you know, although in our community, we saw a little bit of an improvement last week in some of our relevant statistics, such as the number of cases and the testing ratio and the number of people hospitalized, it was clearly for our area, you know, a real cause for concern. But, you know, there are provincial trends, we're part of a province. And clearly the situation across the province has deteriorated significantly and considerably since the Christmas break, all of which is worsened by what is pretty clear that uh, the English mutated virus is now spreading through the province. And as I heard today in one of the sessions, it's not a question of if it's a question of when it becomes the predominant version of the virus it's up to 50 percent more transferable not clear exactly the mechanism by which it's by which it's more infectious but it's really cause for concern but underlying i think what the province has done today it's what's happening in our provincial hospital system and we are part of a provincial hospital system. And because of what's happening in other areas of the province, uh, we have ICU departments, ventilators, not at capacity yet, but projecting that that's going to happen if nothing is done further, likely the first part of February. And where does that get us? That gets us to rationed care. Who gets a ventilator? Who gets to go to ICU? Who gets oxygen? And even though our numbers here locally may be below the provincial average, it'll impact us because our, our hospital is part of the hospital system across the province. And when you run into this crisis situation, other communities where they've run out of capacity, patients are transferred. So we, we are not immune from what's happening. And thus, the provincial government and the direction of Premier Ford made a decision for an increased lockdown. So what does that mean? for all of us. Certainly there are some businesses that will have to close. There are a number of restrictions that apply in particular to businesses. More coming on that tomorrow. What it means for us as individuals is instead of being asked to stay home, we're being told to stay home. And I know that goes against the grain for many of us who cherish our freedom and our liberties, but it's pretty clear we're now into a crisis We've got to get through the next couple of months until April, May, and June when we know the mass vaccination will be in place. And for many of us, and I've done some checking myself, it's unlikely that even myself with the complications I have and the medical conditions I have to, unlikely I'll be seeing a, a vaccination before me. And, you know, I've got an age factor and some health factors. So, it's going to clearly be because of the supply issues from April right through to August for the full vaccination mass vaccination program to be completed. And we've got to get through the next couple of months to get us there. And getting us there means the end of the virus. So we're all going to have to be much more diligent. I know many of you, most of you have been very diligent. That's why in this area we've done pretty well. We're going to have to redouble our efforts, double down. And for those who've been a bit cavalier, and hey, I was being a bit cavalier through the summer, weren't we all, when the virus was, the uh, incidence was low and the weather was nice, but now we're in the middle of winter. We've got to double down. We've got to stay home unless it's for an essential trip, either to work or to groceries or to go to the pharmacy. And that's why I'm home tonight. You know, I, I normally chair these meetings, community the whole and council from the council chambers. I feel very comfortable in the council chambers. I love being at City Hall. I love interacting with staff. And I just feel that, you know, it's important for the mayor to be at city council in the city council chambers when we have so many city staff that are being asked to, you know, be on the front lines and have to report to work. And so we're being told if you can work from home, work from home. And clearly I can, even though it go, goes against my basic nature to sit at home, um, but it's important that we all do our part. And so from now on, and while we're through this full lockdown, I'll be 
sharing meetings from home. And uh, <clears throat> although I don't, <laughs> I much prefer to be at the city council chambers, this is the way it's gotta be. So we'll also hear later this evening from our CEO, he'd like to make a few comments. Uh, I'll be doing some videos later in the week. Once we have all of the detailed regulations in the province, I can pass on some you know, useful information to the community. And lastly, look, we've been through this in March. Don't we all have a big sense of deja vu? But didn't we do so well in March? Because I'm proud of our community. We took the recommendations being made to us seriously. I know that through the summer and the fall, we began to think, many of us, oh, it's not really necessary. Yeah, I'm not really at risk. And hey, we're doing pretty good here. For the next month or two, that's not good enough. We got to buckle down. And I'm sure we all will. I'm confident we will as a community and we'll do what we've done previously in this pandemic and what we've done in other challenges our community has faced. You know, we're tough in Brantford. We know how to deal with adversity. I have no, no, not an iota of doubt that we're going to come through this and we'll come through this probably better than most communities. So with that, we'll move into the agenda. And I have to ask members if they would like items separated for discussion purposes. I should make a note that item 7.11, Alfred Street and Arthur Street at Shallow Creek Park Traffic Control, that will be separated because Councillor Wall has an amendment. So are there any other requests for separation? Use the participants box and the raised hand. I don't see anybody. I'm going to give you a countdown, you know, five, four, three. <laughs> I guess I won't encourage it. So, well, I think we've set a new record. No one's asked anything to be separated. But then again, it's a different kind of a day, isn't it? So with that, Julia, I have to tell you, you can see that uh, unless I'm missing something and someone's desperately trying to raise their hand, and it's not coming through, but they would be waving at me. Um, we have no items that are separated for discussion purposes. So I'm going to, before we take the vote on that, I'm please, I'm gonna ask Councillor Martin, if you would please make a motion then to approve all the items for consideration and consent, uh, items 7.1 and 7.2 that have not been separated, which is pretty much all of them except 7.1.1. So if you would please read the motion and state your seconder. I move seconded by Councillor McCurry that items, that all items contain uh, for consideration, 7-1 and 7-2, not separated for discussion purposes, be approved. Thank you. So before I call the vote, Julie, would you please be kind enough to read the title of, <clears throat> of the various items that we'll be approving through this vote? Thank you. Uh, so the items that are subject to this vote, 7.1.2, 2021 interim property tax, 7.1.3 Part Lot Control Relief Application PLC 0324 Harris Avenue, 7.1.4 Completion of Major Preventative Maintenance Services on Gensets at the Landfill Gas Utilization Facility, 7.1.5 Gray Street and Cumberland Street Traffic and Parking Control, 7.1.6 par Parking Bylaw 14488 Amendment Enbridge Gas Inc. Vehicles, 7.1.7 .7 Thomas Avenue at Pace Avenue Traffic Control, 7.1.8 traffic uh, transfer payment agreement investing in Canada infrastructure program ICIP public transit stream intake one 7.1.9 transfer payment agreement municipal transit enhanced cleaning 7110 universal transit pass amending agreement with Wilfrid Laurier University and Wilfrid Laurier University Students Union 7.1 11, Cultural Hub Investigation Update and Next Steps. 721, CAO COVID-19 Emergency Update. And 7.2.2, All Minutes. Okay. Sorry, I've just had a little glitch here in my... So with that, if uh, you would please take the vote. All items not separated for discussion purposes carry unanimously on a recorded vote. Those in favor, Mayor Davis, Councillor Sless, Martin, Antosky, Wall, Weaver, Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, and Van Tilborg. All right, thank you very much, Julia. So now we'll now move into the statutory 
uh, public hearing for the one planning matter that's on our agenda this evening. And this uh, meeting, this part of the meeting is held in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. The purpose of the meeting is to discuss the planning application and to hear from the public either in support of or in opposition to the application and obviously to hear from the applicant and staff. At the end of the public meeting, the committee will pass a recommendation which is um, generally considered for a final decision at the next meeting of council, which would be in approximately two weeks. The name of anyone who speaks in regard to any item tonight will appear within the meeting minutes. Anyone wishing notice of any further proceedings regarding this application should also leave their name and address with the clerk. The procedure we follow is that the applicant will speak first, will be asked questions, followed by municipal staff with council members asking the questions they have, and then, of course, we hear from the public. The applicant will then have an opportunity to provide clarification to any questions or issues which are raised during the course of the meeting, and in particular, when we hear from the staff and members of the public. So, as I said, we have one matter before us. It's an application for an official plan amendment, OP0420, and zoning bylaw amendment PZ1520. It's regarding 34 Norman Street. So I now ask the applicant and or the applicant's agent to attend before us. And if you please state your names and present your application, I believe you are led by Brenda Keyes from the GSP group. There I see you, Brenda. All right, so the floor is yours, Brenda. Good evening, councillors and Mayor Davis. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, we're very excited about this development um, by Vicano Developments. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. And you can click. So as you're all aware, the owner is uh, Vicano, which is a full service construction company that has, a, a, in my mind, a stellar reputation in Brantford. Um, and they are the, the people behind it, including uh, Paul and Peter Vicano, as well as Mike Leschuk for this development. In terms of the project team presenters this evening, you can click. Um, we have myself, Brenda Case from GSP Group. Uh, we have Rick Lintak, who is the architect from Lintak Architects. We have Rajan Phillips from Paradigm Transportation Solutions. And we also have Aaron Haniff from L SLR Global Environmental Advisory Solutions to address the impacts of, of um, uh, the noise on this particular development. Next slide, please. Okay, from a community perspective, I'm sure all of you know this site well, especially because of its location next to the, fire, or the new fire hall. Uh, but this gives you a general idea. The map identifies uh, where the property is in relation to um, King George Road or Highway 24, Highway 403, as well as the adjacent land uses. So we have north and east of us, we have single detached dwellings. Kitty Corner to the northeast, we have the Fairview United Church. To the west, we have not shown on this particular plan, uh, we have the new fire hall. And to the south, we have the church, um, as well as singles along the west side of uh, Willow Drive. Next slide, please. So we've had um, a couple of, um, oh, next slide, is mine frozen? There we go. Um, from a community perspective, we had an initial community open house um, in January of 2020, so basically a year ago. And that was followed by our second neighborhood consultation process, which was sponsored by the city back in September of 2020. So a number of comments um, and issues were identified by the community through this process. And I've sh I just want to show you them up there. So in terms of form and density, we had a preference for um, townhouses over apartments with fewer units. Um, from a height perspective, they were looking for something more like two stories to preserve their privacy and overlook. With respect to traffic and intersection improvements, the community was concerned about some existing intersections and what, that Im what the impact this development would have on them. From a noise perspective, they were concerned about truck traffic in the Highway 403 and the city identified a concern with respect to the adjacent fire hall. With respect to um, construction impact, we had some residents that were concerned about um, what the construction impact would be on their adjacent dwellings or in their dwellings in the, in the immediate vicinity, as well as um, tree preservation. Next slide, please. 
So as a part of this overall development, um, as planners and developers, we have to look at the planning policy framework that exists in this province. So in the beginning, first click please, we have the 2020 provincial policy statement and the 29, 2019 growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. These are very specific policy documents that we must follow um, with respect to any development application and that the city must abide by as well. So those two provincial policy documents that are in front of you that you see up there on the screen, they speak to um, an encouragement of intensification, transit support of development, um, di a diverse housing stock and sustainability and climate change at a very high level. So these are the types of things we have to be um, cognizant of when the city and we as, as development consultants are evaluating uh, what our clients are proposing uh, us to bring forward to you. Finally, we have the Brantford official plan. Click please. Um, we have the existing Brantford official plan as well as the draft 2020 Brant uh, Brantford official plan. And with respect to those uh, policies, um, they do encourage intensification and um, which is also supported uh, provided you meet certain criteria. And those criteria are, are in front of you on the screen there. So let's go to the next slide, please. We also have to look at um, urban design. So this is huge in any municipality, especially given the type of intensification that is happening throughout the province. So the city of Brantford has specific um, principles with respect to urban design. Section 14 of the official plan contains the city's comprehensive urban design guidelines that were considered in the design of this proposed development. The urban design guidelines for intensification speak specifically to proposals within residential areas like this one and provide direction regarding the site design and building orientation, the built form, the height and massing, building articulation and detailing, as well as building materials. Next slide, please. So in terms of this particular proposed development, we're looking at a building oriented along Fairview Drive with a step down in building height from seven stories to two stories at the eastern end closest to Wayne Drive to transition to the detached dwellings facing the east side of the street. Um, so if, if you look at, it, it, says, it says right there that it's a um, six story building. It's a technically, according to the zoning bylaw, it's a seven story building. I've identified as a six story building with a rooftop amenity area because that's really what it is. There, it, there aren't dwelling units at the seventh level, at the seven story level, it's a rooftop amenity area. So that's why it says six stories plus rooftop amenity area. We're looking at 84 units, uh, one to two bedroom high end condominium units that are targeted, that will be targeted to seniors. We're looking at a, both indoor and outdoor amenity areas as well as 135 surface par parking spaces that exceeds the city's minimum by approximately nine spaces. Next slide, please. Um, first click. So the original design back in 2019, when we brought this forward to the community, um, this is the design concept that we had brought forward at that time. The original building was six story slab apartment building with limited building articulation. Uh, while a general building setback was provided along Wayne Drive, the massing of the building at the east end of the building was not very attractive. And similarly, limited building articulation did not address the visual massing of the building from Norman Street and Fairview Drive pursuant to the official plan's urban design policies. Click please. In contrast, our new building design, this is the same view, shows you uh, the transition that we've us established from in height from Wayne Drive as you move westerly. Uh, it provides building articulation to break up and soften the massing so it's not just one color. We have a lot of in and out happening, uh, increased depth to the building. And we definitely have enhanced plantings proposed and fencing along Wayne Drive and Norman Street. Next slide, please. With respect to the site and building design, um, First click, the proposed development has been designed to address and respect the pedestrian scale of development along Wayne, Wayne Drive and Norman Street. So we're trawling, ca calling that pedestrian scale because it's at, at, at the lower level as you walk down the street. In addition, next click please. 
we, I'd like to talk about the neighborhood scale. So at a broader level along Fairview Drive, which is a minor arterial road, we've looked at a design that that is, is sympathetic to that particular, to the characteristic of that street, which is more at a neighborhood scale. Recognizing that Fairview Drive is an arterial road, a minor arterial road, which is designed to carry large volumes of traffic and service a broader area. Next slide, please. So let's look at Wayne Drive and Norman Street. So when I talked about the pedestrian scale form, um, the, these are the two streets that I'm talking about. So as you're walking down these streets, that's the pedestrian scale I'm talking about. First click. So we're looking at um, four, a four meter enhanced landscape strip along Wayne Drive and Norman, and Norman Street. This four meter landscape strip measures from the property line. Accordingly, visually, there will appear to be approximately 10 meters of landscaping. If you actually include, if you go from the actual physical street edge um, to the, the, um, the fence that we're showing in, in that particular drawing there. Next click. In addition, we have to, we, we'd like to note that there's more than 70 meters diff distance from the building that we're proposing to the existing buildings on the north side of Norman Street. So that's quite a separation distance versus if we had pushed this building all the way north um, to be adjacent to Norman Street. Final click, please. And then we look at the stepping down of the building. So as I mentioned, as you move from, um, from east to west on the property, the, we step down the building from six stories down to two stories as you get closer to Wayne Drive where the existing dwellings are closer to the street. So when you look at this landscaped area here, it actually includes more than 11 meters of landscaped area. If you go from the actual building to include the landscaped area that we're proposing, plus the municipal right of way till you get to the edge of the street. So we think that that's a really nice pedestrian environment that's being created, as well as the stepping down of the building height. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to have Rick, Rick Lintax gonna, gonna speak to you about this. He is um, the, the architect on the file who designed the building and he can provide you a little more information related to the neighborhood scale and, and how the building was designed. Rick. I'm sorry, Mr. Lentak, we aren't able to hear you very well. If you could. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, <clears throat> we can hear you now. OK, sorry about that. Um, okay, the, uh, the proposed six story apartment with the rooftop patio is uh, contextually appropriate along Fairview Street, um, as uh, given that Fairview Drive is designated as a minor arterial road, um, its proximity to King George Road intensification corridor to the west. Uh, the site is on the edge of a residential neighborhood. The site area is large enough to allow for an appropriate transition in height. Uh, the area is well served by park, public parkland, recreational, and community services. And the proposed uh, setback along Fairview Drive provides a balance between providing a prominent street present, presence through minimal, set, minimal setback and aligning with the existing residential properties. Uh, next slide, please. So the, um, uh, so this, uh, the first two stories are differentiated from the stories above through building material, uh, the, dark, uh, the dark brick. Um, this color and material differentiation reinforces and creates the appearance of a building podium to create a stronger visual tie to the surrounding one and two story existing houses as well as reinforce the pedestrian scale and orientation of the building. 
Um, private patios are on the ground floor units and they're elevated above the, uh, the grade of the, of the surrounding property. Uh, foundation walls are made of uh, light colored stone. Weather protection is provided for each, uh, each balcony and uh, covered from the uh, balcony floor above it. And the uppermost balconies have pitch roofs, uh, which is a common element that we find in the neighborhood. The upper stories will be constructed using a combination of colored precast panels, glass and high pressure laminate panels in a warm wood finish. Um, alternating scale materials, the alternating materials scale down the facade and accentuate stepping of the building down to Wayne Drive. The, the wood laminate finish is proposed on the underside of the balcony roofs as accents to the glass panels. And uh, this material will create a visual tie between the upper and lower stories. Brenda, I can pass it back on to you. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of the um, the amenity spaces, so the, the balconies that you just saw in the previous uh, slide, we just wanted to give you a close up of the type of um, amenity space this would provide. So what we're doing is we're providing individual outdoor balconies, which would include a common outdoor as well as a common rooftop terrace. We've got safe indoor bicycle storage and an indoor amenity space on the ground floor that will be shared by all of the residents. So this precedent image simply provides you with an, an idea of what the balconies could look like. Next slide, please. With respect to the rooftop amenity space, um, the precedent, there's a precedent image in front of you that just shows you the idea of, of what could happen on the rooftop. And what we have there is um, a fence that would go, it, it's actually a noise fence, but it's, it's, a, it's like opaque in terms of, um, it's not gonna be like a solid wall. And what we'd like to do, that would be at above the sixth floor. It'll be set back from the edge of the building and it's just above the parapet. So what, in doing so by providing a, a setback, um, people won't be able to actually stand um, on uh, at the edge of the of the fence and look directly down because it's set back a bit. So we're, we're hoping that that will, well, we're, 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 um, we're confident that that will address the privacy and overlook concerns that the community, some of the community residents had. Next slide, please. Uh, first click. So in terms of the parking and service areas, we've, we've got a parking lot, which you can see there. Um, it's a surface parking lot. What we're doing is we're, we're providing an enhanced landscape strip around the, the edges of it. So along Norman Street and along Wayne Drive, we're providing significant enhanced landscaping. In addition, which will be comprised of um, trees, shrubs, fencing, um, uh, actually quite an attractive uh, wrought iron fence, which we'll, you'll see later in one of the images that we're providing. In addition, um, next slide please, we've got the service areas, which you can see on the west side there where the arrow is for loading and garbage. So we've moved that as far away as possible from any of the existing residential development um, to keep that uh, the potential noise, as well as the trucks going in and out as far away from existing development as we can. And in this case it would be adjacent to the uh, fire hall to the west. We're also providing landscaping adjacent to the fire hall along the western boundary of the building and along Fairview Drive. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned to you before, um, we, we do have this height transition. I thought I'd make it clear by giving you sort of um, what's behind you is a site plan. So you're looking down and if you flip the building up, that this is what it would look like. And what, what I'm accentuating here is the fact that from Wayne Drive, we have, you can see there that there's a setback from the actual street until you get to the property line and that's the municipal right of way. Then we're proposing 11 meter setback which is um, in red at the far right side of the drawing. And at that point, we have a two, two story height for the building. So this, this has a better relationship in our mind to the existing residential dwellings across the street along Wayne Drive. And from there, we go up to six stories in height um, and the rooftop amenity area or by bylaw standards, the seventh story starts further to the west about halfway, about halfway through the, to the build, halfway west. Um, for the length of the building. Next slide, please. So we did have some residents um, that were concerned about the loss of existing trees on the property. So what you see there in red are the existing trees on the site. So we've got, um, I think we've got about five uh, Norway maples. 
um, we've got, sorry, numbered as one, two, five, six, and eight on the property. So you can see those in red on the image in front of you. And what I wanted to um, convey to you is the fact that we have had an arborist look at all of these trees. So the first two um, along Norman Street are in moderate to poor condition with um, the, the number two actually has a strong horizontal limb, which is not a good thing. Now, they could potentially be saved. Uh, we would lose a total of six parking space for that, which again, we could accommodate that because we have an excess of parking. But we really don't think that they're providing any, anything substantial to the development and they will likely um, reach their, their, I guess their lifespan within, within approximately five years. In terms of the Colorado spruce at the northeast corner of the site, there's two Colorado, Colorado spruce there. They're, they're in poor and very poor condition, according to the arborist. Um, you go quite a ways up, the, 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 um, the branches have already been trimmed out. Um, and, and we feel that those um, likely um, are not going to be in, in good shape after a five year period. Next, we go to the uh, Norway maple at five and six. Now both of those would have to come down just because of our proposed development. So we are proposing to eliminate those. And then we look at number seven, which is a honey locust, um, which is right along Fairview Street. This one is in moderate condition, um, but it has a poor overall shape. We could retain it. We don't really think it adds anything, but it could be retained. Whereas number eight, the Norway maple is in the middle of our building, so we can't retain that. So Yes, there could be measures taken to retain some of the trees. However, what, what we strongly believe is that our overall planting plan includes 87 trees. Now that's, that, that's a lot of trees. That's, that, that doesn't include shrubs, that's 87 trees. So we really think that replacing those eight trees, which range from poor to moderate, um, uh, moderate shape, that the replacement with of the 85 trees, 87 trees, I'm sorry, is, is a better idea. So that's where we are from a streetscape or landscape plan perspective. And that would, this landscape plan is preliminary and still would have to be approved through the site plan approval process. But I wanted to show, demonstrate to the, to the councillors, as well as to the community listening in, that we have taken um, a close look at this. Next slide, please. So what planning applications are we looking at? First click. So the current official plan uh, designates our site residential area, low density and elementary school. And we're proposing to redesignate it to a high density to permit the apartment form, the condominium apartment form and the density that we're proposing. So the current maximum density is 32 units per hectare. Um, so our proposed development is at a density of 109 units per hectare, which which means it's considered high density. Next click, please. In the new proposed official plan based on the June 2020 draft, um, this particular, uh, the new official plan proposes to designate this area as residential and an official plan amendment would not be required subject to meeting a set of criteria. And that set of criteria um, pertain to mid-rise development and the specific criteria that we would have to satisfy to meet that, uh, to, to allow for this development without requiring an official plan amendment um, are as follows. So there's, there's five of them. Number one is be on a site su of a suitable size for the proposed development and provide adequate landscaping, amenity features, buffering, on-site parking and garbage pickup and recycling services. Number two, the city shall encourage the use of underground and or structured parking facilities for mid-rise apartment buildings. Number three, be located in proximity to parks, open space and other community facilities, services and amenities. Number four, have frontage on a major or minor collector or major or minor arterial road. And five, have convenient access to an existing or planned public transit stop. So we generally meet um, these particular criteria. So I just wanted to raise that, that under the new official plan, we, we, we are fitting in with the, with, the, with, the, with the vision for this area. Next slide, please. So we have an official plan amendment that's required. And next we have a zoning bylaw amendment that's required because obviously the site still has an institutional zone on it for the former school that was on the property. 
In addition, we're asking for a site specific to the residential high density zone. And those site specifics um, relate to these uh, five specific um, things. The first one is Fairview Street. We're asking that it be established at the front lot line because that's really where the building faces and that is the front of the building. We're asking for a reduced front yard setback from 7.8 meters to 7.5 meters. We're asking for a reduced westerly side yard setback. So that would be the side yard that's adjacent to the uh, fire hall from 10.5 meters to three meters. We're limiting the height of the building to seven stories, um, whereas the high density residential zone permits a, a higher height. And we're, we're requesting, um, we're adding a requirement for a 2.1 meter high noise fence around the rooftop amenity area to ensure that that is put in the, in the document. The noise study that was done, um, that was the recommendation of the noise study. So by adding it to the zoning bylaw, we're ensuring that that um, noise provision is included for the development of this site. Next slide, please. And you can click right away. So as you know, there are a number of studies and reports that are required as a part of the review of any development application. We went through a pre-consultation process that identified what studies are required. And the list that you see in front of you is are the engineering, transportation, impact assessment, and design and planning studies that were required as a part of this submission. Next slide. In addition, a sun shadow impact study was required. And this, this was done following the city's standard requirements. There are three um, criteria that the city looks at to ensure that residential private outdoor amenity space is respected. Any communal outdoor amenity space is respected and not negatively impact. And that building faces are not negatively impacted. So the um, the plan before that the drawings before you along the right side of the slide show you in the worst case scenario during March um, how the slides impact development existing development in in this area and what we have what we concluded is that um, the proposed development meets the city's criteria with respect to shadow impacts. Next slide please. And I'd like to ask Aaron Haniff from SLR, Global Environmental Envi and Advisory Solutions, to speak to the noise assessment that was done um, related to this development. Aaron? Excellent. Thank you very much. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, as Brenda said earlier, there was some concerns about the impacts of the heavy vehicles traveling along uh, Highway 403 in the area. So our big study included the four roads surrounding the development, as well as the impacts of 403 on our proposed development. So we saw on the south side facing towards the 403 that there will be slight excesses of the uh, guidelines in the area, which is the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation of Parks, so MECP document, NPC 300. So we came up with a couple of noise recommendations in order to be able to bring this proposed development into compliance with those. So the first one is warning clauses. We want to have some warning, warning clauses on title for the outdoor noise area. So the uh, amenity space for the outdoor rooftop area. And also if the sound levels are high enough to warrant it, there is a need for air conditioning, which I believe this development will have installed. So that's not really of concern for this one. The other one is the building. So the building facades uh, have to be of uh, sufficient noise blocking. So you have to deal with uh, STC ratings. Uh, generally, the building, as long as it meets OBC, so Ontario Building Code, the sound levels on the inside of the building will be fine. There are some slight con considerations for when you deal with corner units that you get uh, impacts from two different directions. So you get it on the south side and the east side, or the south side and the west side. So there might be some uh, looking further investigation into the building construction to make sure that, that those situations are not exceeded. The last one for this is dealing with the fire hall. So fire halls are exempt because they're emergency services under both NPC 300, so under the Ministry of Provincial Guidelines, as well as the City of Brantford Noise Bylaw Chapter 554. So no further investigation was done as, uh, as we see in most municipalities, emergency services are obviously a critical needs. So we generally don't look at them from a, from a noise perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now the next six slides I'd like to transfer to Rajan Phillips, 
who is from Paradigm Transportation Solutions to address the transportation issues that were addressed as a, uh, were raised as a part of this redevelopment. Next slide, please. Thank you, Brenda. So I will go through a few slides on the transportation impact assessment that we did as part in support of this development application. Uh, you're familiar with the road network and the study area that are presented here. The blue dots circles are the intersections that were analyzed. And the study was undertaken in consultation with both the city of Brantford and MTO staff. And the location of the site closer to Highway 403 is the main reason for the impact study. As I will show later, the 84 units in the subject development do not create any significant impact on the study area road system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the development is a low trip generator. It generates less than 40 uh, peak hour trips either in the morning or in the afternoon. It adds less than 10 vehicles in any direction to any of the main roads at the intersection, say for instance, to King George Road at Fairview Drive, Fairview Drive uh, going east-west at King George Road, and similarly to King George Road or Wayne Drive at Norman Street. At the last meeting, there were questions about uh, traffic going north on Wayne Drive to connect with King George. Uh, as I will show, the vehicle, the number of vehicles that may do that are around less than seven, less than seven vehicles. So, and they have the option of either going on King George or on Wayne Street. So the, the impact of this development on these streets is, uh, is either minimal or negligible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this indicates the, uh, the traffic controls at the existing intersections that were studied. I, I wouldn't dwell on this at length. This is more a technical piece of information, but these were the intersections that we analyzed based on the traffic control measures that are in place right now. Next slide, please. The impact of developments at key intersections. Uh, the existing intersections are, the existing traffic conditions or volumes at these intersections are significantly high, especially because of the Highway 403 ramp that connects with Fairview Drive. So this development adds five vehicles to over 500 vehicles during peak hour uh, on, on Fairway Drive, uh, Fairview Drive and Highway 403 ramp. It adds five or seven vehicles to over 1,000 vehicles during peak hour at the intersection of Fairview Drive and King George Road. And, on, and similarly, we analyzed the need for signals, or whether the signals will be warranted at Wayne Drive uh, and Fairview Drive intersection. The signals are not warranted, but the RAM queue extends uh, this intersection during the PM peak hour, even under existing conditions. Next slide, please. These are the projected traffic volumes. Uh, the, what are shown in brackets uh, are the traffic contributed or generated by the development in the different directions along the site, uh, the study area roads. The, the larger number in front of the bracketed number, uh, that number represents the volume that is existing volume uh, on the road system. So you, it, it, it gives a comparison of what is out there now and the really insignificant or minimal number of vehicles uh, that will be added by the proposed development. Next slide, please. Road traffic impacts, I believe this is my last slide. So the main findings of the study are that existing, there are existing high peak hour traffic volumes on King George at Fairview. And there are existing capacity queuing problems during PM peak hour, especially on Fairview Drive because of the ramp, uh, the westbound off-ramp intersecting meeting Fairview Drive. And we have analyzed the existing conditions and future conditions independent of this development at some length in the study, which provides some suggestions for, uh, for potential solutions, especially on Fairview Drive. And we have also indicated that the new fire hall entrance on Fairview Drive may provide some opportunity to address them. 
uh, as far as the development is concerned, its impacts are minimal. And that is what we have concluded in the study. I think, Brenda, that's my last slide, I believe. Thank you, Rajan. Next slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so we do, now that all those studies are done and we've taken all of that into consideration, we as planners have to look at um, the provincial policies, the, the official plan policies that exist, and we have to reach a conclusion. So from a planning perspective, um, we believe the proposed mid-rise condominium residential apartment building represents an appropriate form of development given the site size, location, frontage on a minor arterial road and proximate, proximity to transit services. Um, click please. So what you see in front of you are, are the basic um, the basic justification that, that we provided as a part of our planning justi justification report that was submitted with this application. So it's, it's a quick overall summary, Reader's Digest condensed version of, of, our, um, of our analysis. So we're respectfully requesting that the committee support this development, this proposed development in, according with, in accordance with planning staff's recommendation. Next slide, please. And, and to give the community an idea of, of what happens next, I'm sure the planner is going to do this, but I, but I like to always identify where we are in the process. So this, this line that you see, this, this uh, planning line shows you where we, where we were and where we are now. So we started back in December of 2019 with a pre-consultation meeting. We had a neighborhood open house. We completed our application form. We got comments from the municipal departments and agencies. We responded to them. We, we made modifications to our, to our design. We then had a city sponsored open house in September. Uh, we made further modifications and, and worked on some other some other issues as well. And now we're here um, at the Committee of the Whole and Community Development meeting and we support staff's recommendation which will be um, provided a little bit later. And the next step would be City Council um, from our perspective hopefully for approval. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that, that's all we have at this point. We'd like to thank planning staff for their assistance and thank you um, committee members and mayor for your, for your attention and patience in listening to our, to our uh, presentation. And we'd be pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Oh, you're not muted, Mr. Mayor, but we can't hear you. So oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry, some audio problems, working out a little bugs from doing this from home. So uh, thank you very much, Brenda. That was a very thorough and complete presentation. And so we do have some questions. First of all, from Councillor Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Brenda, that, that was an excellent presentation, uh, by the way, it was very well done. Um, so I just have some questions about uh, parking. So I know we have a development in my ward um, that occurred, everything went well. And then once it was built, um, we discovered that uh, the headlights from parking was uh, a major issue with some of the neighboring residents. So can you tell me what we're doing to make sure that that's not gonna be an issue to those folks on Norman Street? And in particular, the folks on Wayne Street where this property would be exiting out, um, what are we doing to make sure that those residents aren't going to have headlights um, flashing into their front windows? Okay, so in terms of the uh, Norman Street, if you if you look at the parking spaces, um, we're going to ensure from, we're going to ensure from a landscape perspective that that there is um, sufficient plantings to buffer that situation. Uh, same thing along Wayne Drive for the parking spaces. When it comes to uh, lights potentially going into um, living rooms, I think it will, as a part of the site plan approval process, we will ensure that the accesses are lined up in such a way that they're not going into their, their front windows. Um, they're not driving straight out, looking into, into where their front window is. So I think those are the types of things that can be addressed through the site plan approval process. Um, and I would ask uh, either Peter Ya or, um, Peter, Paul, or Mike, if they would like to add anything. I think you covered it then, Brenda. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. 
You're muted, Mr. Mayor. Next, Councillor Martin. Thank you. In your presentation, you indicated that March was the worst month for the shadows. I would suggest that the winter solstice is uh, longer shadows than the spring equinox. Do you have shadow diagrams from December? We do. I don't have them available on, on screen right now, but we can definitely get those to you. They, they did form a part of the study that was done. Yes, winter is the, the worst case scenario. You're absolutely right. Um, generally, when it comes to municipalities and their criteria, they don't use December. And a big part of that is because the days are shorter anyways, and there is already a lot of shadow happening. So we don't generally use as a criteria to satisfy um, municipalities don't use December as their, as their benchmark date. But uh, we can definitely provide those to you if, if you would for, like them. For future, yes, I would. And for future residents, don't refer to March as the worst for shadows, because obviously December is. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, would you be willing to pay for uh, traffic lights for the intersection of Wayne and Fairview? Um, I would defer that to Peter and, and Paul Vicano, but I think the issue that we have is they're not justified based on um, the traffic study that was create, that was done for our development. So our development does not um, generate sufficient traffic to justify lights at, the, at that intersection. Okay, I'll ask that of staff as well. Thank you. Next, uh, Councilor McCreary. Mayor, thank you and welcome folks. Thanks for being here today. Uh, and I wanna commend you on a development which is uh, pretty good looking compared to what you started with uh, way back when. Um, I wonder if you could tell me, uh, and this may be a, um, a bit of an unfair question, but if you were unable to receive relief from things like heights and setbacks, would you still be building a, um, a tall building or would you be doing something else on that site? Um, I, I think from a marketing perspective um, and, and what, what the market demands, uh, this is the type of development that, that we need to make this a feasible project. So that's what's before you today. We did look at other development scenarios. We looked at townhouses. We looked at singles. And um, singles, first of all, doesn't meet um, provincial, well, it doesn't meet provincial policy in terms of intensification criteria. We're, we're looking for a mix of dwelling units. We're looking at higher densities in existing neighborhoods. And because we're on Fairview Street, it, it, it supports, um, we, we meet the criteria that says this is a great location to provide for a different type of development at a higher density than what you currently see. So, so while townhouses um, may fit, um, is it the appropriate density at this location? From a planning perspective, we feel that this is this is a this is an appropriate development, and from a financial perspective and feasibility for that the owner has gone through, there is a market for for seniors development in this type of a uh, this this form of a condominium presume, apartment. I would presume your return on investment is more significant as well. Yes, it well it makes it feasible. There's no question. And we we, we tend to think of it as Fairview Drive actually. Sorry, Fairview Drive. <laughs> now. Um, my other question to you would be, um, would you be willing to consider um, a, a more um, impenetrable visual barrier along Norman and Wayne? Um, the, um, the rendering showing the trees is, uh, it looks very nice from, from a top down point of view, but um, it's pretty impermeable when one looks across the street at a sea of parking that's gonna be um, showing. Is that something you'll consider? I think that's definitely something we can look at through the site plan approval process, um, and, and we can we can dis discuss that internally with with my sure. client. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. P pardon me, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I was just I was just about to call in a councillor and Tosk. I remembered you told me that uh, during the presentation you you realized this. You think you would like to make a declaration of conflict of interest. Th Thank you. My apologies to you, Mr. Mayor, and to my colleagues. It wasn't apparent until the first slide from the applicant. Um, and although it's not a pecuniary um, declaration, there is a perception, a possible perception of conflict. The architect is, I'm related to the architect. He's a cousin of mine. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> now we know. <laughs> Family connections made on the planning area. But so you, of course, you'll fill out the appropriate form for the clerk. Of course, um, thank next. you. All right, thank you, Councillor Antoski. So up next is Councillor Radley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for your presentation. 
um, very nice looking, beautiful uh, building. Um, are these rentals or ownership? Ownership, condominium ownership. ownership. That's right. Would there be a, um, a, a, um, a, a condo uh, association? Yes. I would assume, yeah, good. And what's the square footage, average square footage of the units? I'm going to ask Rick, Rick Lintech that or the Vicanos. Just the size of the units. Yes, yeah, so I'm looking at the uh, floor plan, uh, Brenda, and, and they vary. They vary from uh, a high of 990 square feet for a two bedroom and uh, um, 650 square feet for a one bedroom. Um, so that's about it, 650 to 980 square feet. Great, thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, does that include uh, storage space or will storage be uh, separate? No, we are providing a, a, a basement storage uh, yeah. room for each and every apartment that will uh, um, provide for storage of bice bicycles and that yep. sort of thing, yes. That's great, thank you, Peter. And for those of us wanting to downsize, to downsize to put all our stuff. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> thank you. Next, Councillor Carpenter. Thank you. Uh, the, 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 the top floor that's all glassed in, is that amenity space? Yes, that, so the, the very top area, it's not enclosed in, ter in terms of having a roof, it's a rooftop amenity area. Yeah, below that you have the uh, completely glassed in area at one end of the building. Is, is that uh, units or is that a further amenity space? Those are units okay. on six level. Okay, and the two units that stick out uh, uh, on the side, are they larger units? Is that why they're, they're only two stories there? Rick, maybe you can clarify those units or Peter. I was going to hope Rick would answer that. <laughs> um, Pulling out the floor plans quickly. Yeah, I'm trying to. Sorry. Yes. No, they're not. They're not necessarily larger units. Um, they're basically the same size as the others, but they are corner units. They're similar in size to the units at the other end, but um, we just felt it was important for the massing of the building to present a two-story, uh, two-story presence onto that street to. Uh, to just to blend in with the scale of the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear it's going to be a con condominium corporation. That means, of course, it's going to be taken care of by condo fees, and it will look the same as it does when you build it from 15, 20 years from now. Um, yeah, So, the, but the garbage is uh, outside. Is, is everyone responsible for taking their own garbage from their unit to that garbage collection, or is there a central collection that will then be brought out there by, um, by a contractor or, or somebody else? Rick, I'll ask you to respond again. Uh, there is a garbage room within the building, and it'll be uh, transported to, um, to to that to the bin area. Oh, okay. So th then, it, does that mean there's a, there's going to be shoots on all, on all levels? We haven't got into that kind of detail yet. Um, that's something there's there's a bunch of there's some different theories about how garbage is best handled in these multi uh, multi uh, multi unit dwellings. Um, we haven't got into that kind of dis uh, discussion yet with uh, with the client, but uh, we understand it's an important uh, important aspect of site plan, and it will be uh, it'll be it'll be uh, dealt with to everyone's satisfaction. And I, this might be a silly question, but this is going to be built by um, Mr. Vercano. This isn't going to be contracted out. So we have some assurance that we're going to get the quality buildings that we've seen Mr. Vercano build all over the city. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. That's my questions. All right, so we have uh, no other questions. Um, I'd like to thank the applicant and the agents and Mr. Vercano for your very thorough presentation. So we'll now obviously hang on, there may be more questions at the end of the two presentations we're about to hear, but so we'll now move to uh, staff and we have uh, Sean House and Joe Muto and Gary Peaver from engineering. I believe Sean, you're the lead on this one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of committee. 
My name is Sean House. I'm a planner in the community development department. Next slide, please. Planning staff have received an application to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw to facilitate the construction of a seven story apartment building with 84 units at 34 Norman Street. Next slide. The subject lands are bound by Fairview Drive to the north, Wayne Drive to the east, Norman Street to the south, and the newly constructed fire station number two to the west. The photo on this slide is of the subject lands taken from Fairview Drive. Next slide. As mentioned, the surrounding lands include fire station number two to the east. Next slide. The Evangel Church to the south and highway number 403 further south. Next slide. And single detached dwellings to the north and west. Next slide. As previously stated, the applicant is seeking to construct a seven story apartment building with 84 dwelling units and 135 parking spaces. The units will be comprised of one, two, and three bedroom units. And they've indicated that the ownership will be separated through a draft plan of condominium. Next slide. And just a rendering of the proposed building. Next slide. The subject lands are currently designated residential area low density in the official plan. And the applicant is requesting to amend this to residential area high density. The official plan lists criteria that high density applications must conform to, including if the property is on a major road, proximity to commercial areas, and if the location provides a physical transition to lower density residential uses. In planning staff's opinion, these criteria are met. Next slide. The subject lands are currently zoned institutional school zone I-2. And the applicant is seeking to change this to residential high density exception zone 26 or RHD 26. Next slide. As the applicant mentioned, included with the zoning change are the following site specific regulations limiting the building height to seven stories, minimum front, rear, and interior side yards, and a building step back to ensure that the concept plan is developed as presented to staff, the public, and council, and permitting the parking area to be set back four and a half meters from the property line. Next slide. Notice of this meeting was circulated to all property owners within a 120 meter radius. In consultation with the ward councilors, a virtual meeting was held on September 23rd, 2020. As the applicant mentioned, members of the public expressed concerns regarding the proposed building height, volume of traffic and parking. Regarding building height, um, the applicant did submit a sun and shadow analysis that complied with the city's site plan manual. And further, they're incorporating step backs into the, the design, which lessen the impact of the height on the surrounding area. Again, the applicant submitted transportation impact assessment to address traffic concerns. No, no improvements to the existing road network were recommended as a result of the proposal and transportation engineering staff have not identified any issues with the study. In terms of parking, the applicant is providing 135 spaces, whereas the zoning bylaw only requires 123. In staff's opinion, adequate parking is proposed. Next slide. To conclude, staff recommend that this application be approved. It is consistent with provincial policy, the official plan and represents good planning. I do wanna mention one amendment to be made to the recommendation um, that was included in the report. It should also read that um, the application had regard for um, section 17 of the Planning Act as well, that speaks to public notice in the official plan. 
Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sean. Uh, first, uh, Councilor Weaver. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so first question, um, for this development, uh, the fire department's typically on the uh, circulation list. Did we get any feedback um, from them based on the shadowing that would occur? Uh, this, my concern is that where the shadow would be at the fire station is actually their outdoor area. Um, so I'm just curious if there was any feedback from the department. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we did not receive any feedback regarding shadowing on the fire station. Okay, thanks for that, Sean. And then just my next question. Um, so at the intersections of, um, uh, I guess it's Willow and Wayne and uh, Fairview, is there an ability for us to put a traffic circle at that intersection? Uh, through the chair to you, uh, Councillor Weaver, uh, just to clarify uh, the Willow Drive, Willow Drive, Wayne Drive, and Fairview. Yes, I apologize. Thanks, Gary. Yep, no, no worries. Uh, you know, obviously, there's always opportunity uh, at various intersections uh, for a roundabout. Uh, I, I believe that's what you're trying to refer to. Um, you know, for this development, that was never considered. Uh, that would be typically outside of a scope of something of this size. Um, but of course, you know, uh, through future studies, uh, consideration for a roundabout could be considered there. I, I'm just asking because I know um, one of the other councillors had asked uh, about traffic uh, signalization at that intersection and it's not warranted. So I, I think just a traffic circle or a roundabout would just be another way of moving traffic. So that's why I was asking. So, okay, thanks for that, uh, Gary. I appreciate it. Councillor McCreary. Uh, Mayor, thank you. And Sean, good work on this file. Uh, thanks for that. Um, we have a number of uh, relaxations that we're permitting uh, on this site. Um, I guess the most uh, significant is the uh, increase in height from five story to seven story, although um, under other circumstances, they could be going much higher. We're also reducing the minimum front yard by a little bit. Uh, we're reducing the minimum interior side yard by quite a bit. Um, by about seven meters. And um, we're reducing the parking from Norman Street by a meter and a half. Um, now, if we were to enforce uh, all those regulations, um, could you give me an estimate as to the number of units that could be accommodated on this site? Uh, for you, Mr. Mayor, I can't give you an estimate, I would have to likely defer that uh, to the architect actually. It would, you know, be looking at, you know, subtracting however many units are included on, are included in a floor um, you know, by two. Okay. Um, Sean, can you tell me the ratio of parking on this site? The ratio of parking would be over um, over one and a half spaces per unit. That's the minimum required by the zoning bylaw. And they're going above and beyond that. How many spaces, does that include the allotment for visitors? Yes, uh, one and a half spaces per unit includes visitor parking. Is there is there some other part of town where we're allowing 1.3? Uh, have to defer that one to uh, manager of development planning, Joe Mito. Okay. Um, now, um, I guess we're looking at um, probably a population of 100 and 180 people or thereabouts here. It's, it's all condominium. Would, would that be a fair guess to you? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Well, if we look at 84 units, they're marketing these to seniors downsizing. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe two people occupying a unit. So multiply that by two, you know, 160, 170. Um, I think one should also factor in the, um, the ability of owners in this building to rent them out to folks who are other than um, seniors that are downsizing. Um, mm -hmm. is, does that form part of our... Um, our analysis, or are we basing it simply on what we perceive to be 
uh, the population um, at maybe one and a half people. Because um, one and a half parking spots per unit, uh, most, most families are a two car family. Um, and we've heard some concerns from the neighborhood about having the residents of this building parking in front of their houses and using their parking spots. Um, so is, 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 that, is that our regulation? I guess it is our regulation and really is our regulation sufficient uh, in this circumstance? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I do believe it is sufficient. Um, you know, the, the zoning bylaw, it's going to take into account um, in that calculation, maybe uh, occupants uh, or residents that have one car or even no car. It's a very mm -hmm. well serviced site in terms of um, public transit. Um, there's many commercial amenities in close proximity to along King George Road, as well as um, you know recreational facilities that people can walk to, like the Wayne Gretzky center so yeah. you know that calculation it's going to take into account um you know households with you know one vehicle or even no vehicles at all and that that um you know in theory balances out um households that have over the uh, estimated one and a half parking or one yeah. and a half vehicles that would require those parking spaces so sorry again how many how many spaces do we have on this site uh, Sean? I believe it's 135. 135. And if um, <clears throat> if they all have two cars, how many cars are we going to have on the street? Another 40? I Through you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, I, I can't make that um, estimation. So, so how, how many units again, Sean? 78, is that what we said? There's 84 units. 84, sorry, 84, okay. So uh, half of 84 would be, yeah, so it would be another 40 cars on the street if they all have um, two vehicles. Um, and um, do you think that the fact that this is uh, right at a 403 exit ramp would lead us to believe that it's gonna to appeal to commuters? Uh, we're gonna have two cars as opposed to folks that are gonna take the bus? Um, is that uh, is that a fair assumption? Uh, Mr. Maybe House, that's not I, a fair question to ask. Mr. House, if I could just jump in and to, yeah, the to, to Councillor McCreary, I think <clears throat> what we what we've done here is uh, you know they they've come in the applicants come in provided a, a, robust, right. a robust amount of parking that exceeds what's required under the existing bylaw. I mm -hmm. think when when uh, when Mr. Vicano or Mr. Luchuk goes ahead, goes ahead to you know sell these units, the person, the end user, will be uh, known uh, to to have an understanding of how many parking how many parking spaces will be, and they're mar they're marketing these units as such, right? And as Mr. House had already indicated, like this this area or this this building or site is well serviced by transit. Yes, it is off the off the off the 403 off and on ramp very close by, and maybe there is more commuting that could happen, but I think the end user, it's it's really up to that end user to understand that parking for a site of, of this this nature and and who they're they're marketing it to is in terms of seniors. I don't don't know too many seniors that would have two vehicles. I think the whole idea here is when they go to market and folks that go to go ahead and, and end up buying these units will be folks that that understand ideally what what is provided for them here. Um, and and just to just to just to answer your initial question about the 1.3, yes, in other areas of the city, uh, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, we have supported less. We've supported less than 1.3, and that is because of the locational attributes of those specific sites, closer to transit, closer to transportation hubs, and more walkability. And I think you know we're we're in a position here, and I, and I know, councillor, you've you've mentioned this before, and we'll be. You know, we be uh, coming forward next 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 month with our you know our our plan and work plan for our new comprehensive zoning bylaw where we hope to have these types of workshops with council members as well as as the public and the development community to understand what is that exact parking uh, ratio and what's 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 that comfort from both a political uh, standpoint as well as the professional planning standpoint. 
I hope yeah. that answers some of your questions. It does. Thank you very much, Joe. And I, I think if we can if we can take into account locational attributes along Culver Street to reduce the parking to 1.3 per, we should probably be looking at the locational attributes here to be going closer to two per, given that this is um, it's uh, right on the highway. Uh, th thank you very much, guys, for your answers. Councilor Martin. Thank you. Through you to staff, um, the intersection of, of Wayne and Fairview, how close is that to meeting the warrants for upgrading that to lights? Yeah, through the chair uh, to you, Councilor Martin. Uh, just reviewed uh, the TIS numbers, even post development, it still runs, that intersection still runs uh, at a level of service A uh, uh, for that intersection with uh, some components at a B. So warranting a, a, a traffic lights there is not shown uh, within the analysis. Okay, because I know that intersection is quite busy and uh, being four lanes on Fairview and always stops not an optimal option there. Um, okay, that was my questions for staff. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions from the committee members, uh, I want to thank Sean House, Joe Mudo, and Gary Peaver for uh, getting presentation and answering questions. So we're now at that part of the meeting, <clears throat> the hearing where we open the floor to members of the public who wish to speak to the matter. And so for this evening, we did receive uh, two registrants who wish to speak to this matter. So I'll now ask the first, uh, Terry Francoeur, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Terry. If you would, we'll bring you forward, there you are. So now it's uh, your opportunity to speak to this application. And after you finish, there will likely be questions from some of the committee members. Sorry, was that me, Terry? I kicked out there for a second. So Terry, you're up. Okay, my, my uh, I got a couple of questions in there and it's, it's not about the development. I'm okay with the development. It's more again about the parking concerns and the traffic impact study. Uh, according to the traffic impact study done by Paradigm, the intersection of Fairview and uh, King George is running at a level service F. That's like your worst that you're running. I, I'm a traffic engineer myself working for the city of Toronto. The, the other concern, Councilor McCreary was saying, can they make Wayne Street and parts of um, basically Norman Street and no standing, no stopping and restrict nighttime parking so people don't leave their cars overnight? No, Terry, we can't, we, the way this, the public hearing is set up, uh, we consider your questions, we try and get them answered, but um, this is actually your, your time to make your case, make your presentation as to any concerns, which can be raising questions about yeah. the matter, the issue, which will then endeavor, especially the word counselors, get you answers for this later. Okay. Um, the, the other concern I had to do is just the method of the construction. There's been a little bit of damage in the area on the methods with the equipment they used. And there's been a lot of dust when they demolished it. It's being addressed already by um, Peter and Mike. I just want to make sure moving forward that there's uh, measures in place. Is there anything else you want to tell us uh, before nope, I- that's, that's all I have on that one. Okay, Terry. So we do have uh, Councillor Carpenter would like to ask you a question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Terry, uh, for coming. Um, so I believe, was was your question uh, regarding, can we as a city or as the ward councillors bring uh, no overnight parking on Norman Street? Norman or on uh, Wayne, Wayne, either or. or both? Just to stop that infill of people that, uh, right now it's, I think on the east side, it's no stopping. On the west side at the development, it's no parking. But that's not going to stop. You're going to get a lot of seniors in there. And the way they get around the no parking is they, they park with a disabled parking pass. They put their secondary car or extra car out in the street. And nobody will ticket those. They leave those alone. Okay. Okay. So but if it's no standing, no stopping, they, they, they can't park out there. Okay. Yeah. Of course, the answer is, of course, we, that can be done by the ward council. We can do anything we want with parking as long as it passes the committee. So, uh, and you're, you're happy with the design of the building? Oh, absolutely. I have no, and I have no issues with the building. It's just making sure how it's constructed. Okay. And Terry, do you live on Norman or Wayne? I'm on Norman. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. 
I'll chair it. I don't see um, any other questions, any other members raising their hands to ask you questions. But again, thank you very much for appearing tonight. You've raised some questions and I'm, I uh, don't doubt for a minute that the board councillors, councillors Martin and councillor McCurry will endeavor to get you some answers on that. Okay, I appreciate that. It, it also, can you just check with Paradigm on their level of service? They're, they're, they keep quoting Wayne and uh, Fairview, but it, me being living on uh, Norman Street and I try driving, say, west on Norman and try making that left out onto uh, King George Road, I can't get there. It's like impossible. I have to make a right to come around. And certain times a day, I can't take Wayne and go along King George because it's, it's backed up. Now, if they can do some... Uh, turning restrictions at King George and uh, Fairview. No, in the right, right hand turning pros, that gives the opportunity for people on Norman to get out. Makes sense. Okay, thanks again, Terry. Okay, thank you. So we do have uh, another delegate, uh, Michael Arundel, would like to speak to this application. So if we can, Julia, can we arrange for Michael to come in? There you are. Good evening, Mr. Airedale. Thank you very much for coming into the Zoom public hearing. So now is your opportunity to tell us about uh, your position in respect to this application. And after you finish, there uh, may well be some questions for you by committee members. So the floor is now yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, I'm reiterating what Terry just said, what just asked. Uh, a big concern for me is I am on Wayne Drive and right across the street. And parking is a big issue. Uh, I know you have 134 parking spots and I've seen in different areas, I'm in construction uh, development myself, uh, people park wherever they want and for however they, they want. And I used to want people parking in front of my house uh, day and night. And when I have one have company over, there's no place for them to park. Um, so if down the road, when you do, you do do your parking analysis, either have a, a no overnight parking or uh, limited the, the time to be parked on the street, uh, that would be appreciated. Uh, anything else, Mr. Arundel? Uh, no, I do, I do like the change of the design of the building from uh, what it was before to a step up. Uh, I do appreciate that because I was kind of worried of what the design looked like because I did miss the, the first uh, go around of the design. And I was, got, I was really concerned about my property value of what type of development this would be. And I don't want my, develop, my property value to, to be lowered. Makes sense. And um, so, sorry to interrupt you. Keep, go go okay. ahead. And it was mentioned that this is for basically geared for seniors uh how are they how is i would say um how is re the real estate sellers going to pro going to um guarantee that it will be geared to a senior uh, lifestyle and not having people uh, just quickly buy in and rent it out to uh, whoever, and there goes the building, basically, and there goes the quiet area that we that we are living in right now. Okay. Um, good point. Anything else, Mr. Randall? I'm Because I'm sure we hear from the app the applicant after uh, you finish, and I'm sure they'll answer that question. Uh, anything else, Mr. Randall? Uh, I mean, Rush. I just wanted I just want to make sure we you oh, get everything out you want to tell us. But, uh, no, I think that's everything that we that our big concern was was about parking and just the status of of the the residents that are going to be there. Okay. Okay. Well, I have at least two councillors like to ask you questions, and uh, we'll start with Councillor Martin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Arundel. Um, regarding the parking restrictions you'd like to see on Wayne, would you like that on both sides? No overnight parking. 
or are you more worried about in front of your own home? You're, you're muted. Ideally, I would like to see it on both sides of the road. That okay. way you know, traffic can flow and that way no one was, will be parking continuously at a, at, a, at a certain time or day. Okay, and, and you uh, would you like to see a, a limit to the number of hours someone can park or just no overnight parking? Just no overnight parking. Uh, daytime to the, into the evening is fine because people do like to, to visit, but uh, not overnight. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for coming, Michael. Uh, you, you talked about rental units uh, and the worry about uh, whether these would be directed towards seniors. Would you uh, like staff to investigate the opportunity of ensuring the ability to limit the number of rentals at all in the condominium corporation's bylaws that are drafted by the builder? Uh, yes, if you could. If some, some way you can try and enforce that. Well, you know, once what, whatever we can put in, whatever can be put in the condominium le legislation for the unit, it's uh, for the building itself, will be enforceable by the Condo Act itself. So, uh, whatever the limit we can do, uh, uh, you'd like us to do that. That'd be appreciated. Yes, please. Thank you. Mr. Arundel, I think um, you've got your points to us, got them across to us quite clearly, and uh, I don't have any other questions for you. But again, thank you very much, and we'll be uh, dealing with this uh, very shortly. So you'll you know, hang in and watch, and uh, then again, we'll be uh, perhaps dealing with this as well in about two weeks' time to council meeting. I appreciate okay. your time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, and have a good evening. You too. So I uh, don't believe we have any other member of the public who's registered to speak to this matter. So we now go back to the applicant and the applicant's agent. Your opportunity to address any of the questions that uh, have been raised. So if we can bring Brenda back in. Here we go. Hello. <clears throat> okay, so I know that um, we have been in contact with um, Mr. Franker regarding the construction issues that he has concerns over, and we continue to work with him on that. Um, his concerns related to potential damage done to his property as a result of work that's already happened on the property, the demolition process. So we are in contact with him and we are continuing to work with him on that. Um, so, so I don't think we have a problem from that perspective. Um, with respect to the overnight parking, I think that's something that the municipality can make a decision on. Uh, I don't believe we would have any issues with whatever um, street parking changes or restrictions that the uh, city would like to impose for Norman, um, Norman Street, Wayne Drive or Fairview Drive that's completely up to the municipality and we would obviously abide by that. So if they would like, if you would like to restrict the overnight parking along any of those streets, we have no concerns with that. With respect to the, uh, just looking at what I've got written down here, regarding um, parking, insufficient parking. So I, I think that's something that we've, we've discussed. We have provided more than the minimum that, that's required, that is required in recognition that um, there may be a higher demand for parking spaces and we think the the additional nine spaces that we have on site it helps to address that and um, we, we really can't go can't go beyond that I mean the zoning bylaw requires 1.5 and we're providing more than that so that's um, it we really can't anticipate going beyond what what the, the municipal bylaws are requiring us to do. And I don't believe this is an outdated bylaw. So I, I think following the zoning bylaws requirements is, is a good standard that we're following. And residents will be aware when they purchase their units, what parking is available to them. So I think you would make your purchase accordingly, just as if you were buying a home in the an old part of, of Brantford and there's no driveway or bar or um, garage, you're going to base your ability to purchase that that house with no, keeping that in mind, whether or not there's parking or isn't parking. So it's it, it, it's difficult to say how many parking spaces each unit would have. And 
And as we are trying to market this development for seniors, I think, um, uh, I think there are many seniors who are trying to decrease the number of cars that they have um, when, you, when you are retired. So um, I know my, my parents have done that. So I think that's something that it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to make that, that guess. Um, finally, with respect to the, um, what was the last one? limit the rental uh, of condominium units that's um, beyond what what I'm a, what my knowledge base in terms of what can be done through the condominium agreements I would like to potentially ask um, the the owners um, the Vicanos or uh, Mr. Doucette if, if they would be able to jump in here with with that type of with, with a response to that the intent is to sell the sell them as condominium units for ownership and I think with anything else, any type of condo ownerships, you can't control what people do just as you can't control people that own a house and rent it out. Um, but, but I think the, the value of these units, they are going to be high-end condo units. They're not going to be something that you'd want to buy and rent out to students. Um, I don't think they could afford them, quite honestly. So um, that's, that's my little two cents worth on that side of things. But I will ask Peter to definitely chime in with respect to the the potential rental of the condo units at a later date. Yeah, sure, Brenda. Um, no, it'd be very difficult for us to commit to uh, limiting the number of rental units. I, I, number one, I don't understand how we can put those controls in place. I realize there's condominium bylaws that we could put in, but people from time to time may have a need to rent their apartments because of one thing or another that happens in their lives. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I think we're, I think, a, um, I think not a good picture is being painted that this may be rentals. It is not rental. It is condominium. It, we aren't guaranteeing that it's going to go to seniors. Our, our advertising and our efforts is going to go towards seniors. Um, and you know, at first, many people end up renting their uh, condo unit until they find an adequate buyer, an acceptable buyer. So the the limiting of rental is going to be very difficult for us to accept. Um, and regarding the parking spaces, um, the, <laughs> the reason it's one and a half parking spaces per apartment is because it sees the fact that some people may have two cars. If everybody had one car, it would be 84 spaces. So the bylaw already perceives the possible the possibility of having two cars per apartment. That's why it's one and a half. One and a half is um, means that of the 84 units, 42 can have two cars and the other 42 can have one car. And there's going to be, the, there's the other factor that some people may not have any cars. So again, we're, we're well over the minimum required. That's been the standard across the board in the city. Um, the parking on, on the street that can be dealt with if it becomes a problem of which I doubt very much that Parking on the street with this amount of parking, with this building, type of building that we're building, will be an issue. I, I doubt it very much. But again, if and when that situation happens, it can be petitioned to the city to take action then. Again, we're not opposed to uh, no overnight parking, but I think it can be dealt with later. I think from the raised hands, looks like Mr. Doucette is part of your group may want to contribute to the answer to that. Is that correct, Mr. Doucette? Hello, just to add on to what uh, Peter had said as well, I think looking at the occupant counts, like a lot of, we're in desperate need of a new condominium premium residence in the north end of Brantford. There has not been a building put up in 30 to 35 years. But if you do look at those older buildings and you look at the occupants in the buildings, just the natural demographic is a single user. 
uh, like over 50 to 60 percent of those units in village towers are single individuals. I, I think the parking count takes care of itself when you take into account that a lot of them are single residents. All right, so Councillor Martin, I think, has a couple of questions. Councillor Martin. Thank you. With some condominiums, you have to buy the parking spots you need as well as buy your unit. Will you have assigned parking at this facility? Assigned parking? No. No, uh, if, if you mean by assigned parking, um, people's names are numbered. No, it's going to be random parking. Okay, because if it was assigned parking, once you run out of the extra 51 uh, parking spots, people would know that they're only going to be able to get one parking spot and it might influence their decision to buy and limit the number of two car uh, families that are, that are uh, buying in this building. Okay, um, and is there gonna be any provision for charging electric vehicles? Absolutely, yes. There'll be a minimum of two, maybe three or four. Very good, thank you. Councilor Carpenter. Thank you, some of my questions have been, been answered already. Uh, uh, Peter, when would you like to start construction and when do you plan on finishing? I know your schedules are pretty prompt. As soon as the same, the same day we're issued a, a building permit, we'll be digging a hole. Okay, and you you uh, have a, a completion date in mind or no? As soon as possible. Okay, <laughs> I right, thank you. And I'd just <laughs> like to ask you one thing. I, I know a fair bit about condominium and condominium legislation. I know when you're drafting the condominium bylaws, would you consider uh, the possibility of uh, no smoking clause in your condominium bylaws? And it is legal to do that. I know that we have condominiums that have that. Uh, for sure, for sure. It, 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 it makes for a, a, a better building not having to smell people's excess smoke and it's safer. Thank you. I totally agree and we will do that. Thank you. Dr. Sloss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, during staff's presentation, I believe they, they indicated there were one, two and three bedroom units. And I believe in uh, the proponent uh, presentation, it was one and two bedroom units. Can you clarify which it is? It's one and two. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, that looks to be all the questions. Again, uh, thank you very much to Mr. Buchanan, Brenda and Ed for giving us some additional information and responding to some of those questions. Most welcome. All right, I'd now ask uh, Councillor Carpenter, would you be prepared to uh, move item 5.1? And if you are, the your seconder. Thank you, Mr. Floor. Mayor, and um, my seconder has declared a conflict, so I'm seeking a seconder. I uh, see Councillor Weaver. Weaver. Thank you. Uh, right. we'll, we'll, plan. We'll, take, we'll take Councillor Utley then. Yes, thank you. Okay. Official plan amendment application number OP0420 submitted by GSP Group on behalf of Accounting Developments affecting the lands located at 34 Norman Street to change the official plan designation from residential area low density to residential area, area high density to permit the development of a seven story apartment building be approved. And that zoning bylaw amendment application PZ 1520 submitted by GS Group Incorporated on behalf of Bacano Developments affecting the lands located on 34 Norman Street to change the zoning of the lands from institutional services zone to residential high density exception 26 zone be approved subject to the application of a holding provision in accordance with the application provisions as noted in section 9.2 of the report 2021-2 and that see that the bylaw to remove the holding eight provision for the subject lands not be presented to council for approval until the following conditions have been satisfied. Condition one, that the applicant, applicant has provided a signed site plan agreement to the corporation of the city of Brantford along with all necessary securities and condition two, that all servicing issues financial and otherwise have been addressed to the satisfaction of the corporate city of Brantford, and D that pursuant to section 34 of the uh, subsection 18.2 of the Planning Act uh, 1990 paragraph 13, uh, the following statement shall be included in the notice of decision. Regard has been had for all written and oral submissions received from the public before <coughs> the decision was made in relation to the planning matter as discussed, as discussed in section 8.2 and 9.3 of the report. And just quickly speaking to it, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's no other developer in this city that I know has been has has built the kind of quality product that Vicano Development has done, and I know that 
Peter living in this community has, has made it his, his purpose to build quality development uh, so that we, because he respects what he builds and he respects what the city looks like. In fact, if you look at the fire hall next door, that one of those examples. So, uh, and, and the residents were, uh, the adjustment in the design of this building uh, to a, such a high standard uh, shows the quality of the development. Now we know the province has made regulations that say we must have more intensification. And uh, what's happened here is the intensification has been pushed forward to Fairview Drive as much as possible to take the impact off of the residential neighborhood behind. I think that's been that's been very thoughtful and well thought out. So it's a good development in, a, in 84 units. I have no doubt will be purchased by uh, upper mobile citizens or seniors looking to move out of their large homes that they can, they can get an awful big dollar for today and move into these condos uh, in, a, in, in a space that they need. Thank you. Next, uh, Councillor Well. Thank you, Mayor Davis, and through you. So, I mean, there's a lot I was going to say, but many of the other councillors here just said it. So I honestly just want to say thank you to the developer for building up and not out. We desperately need places for people to call home and Councillor Carpenter touched on it. Um, but this is going to give an opportunity for people who live in Brantford to be able to sell their homes uh, and move into a unit like this, which then shuffles the deck and opens up a home for someone to live. And there are people who want to live in Brantford and they can't find a place. There are people this is an incredible project. It's built by an incredible developer and it's exactly the kind of projects that we need to see in this community. And I just wanna put it on the record and say how thankful I am that this site is being developed. It is every other day I am tagged on social media or stopped by somebody who questions why this site hasn't been developed. It's been vacant and empty for so long and uh, they wonder why are we holding them back? Are we stalling it? Are we holding off? And finally, we will see construction uh, happening on that site and you know 84 units that's a lot of people who are going to move to this community and live and love in Brantford and I happily support this development and uh, I'm thankful to the developer for working with the community to make sure that their concerns are heard and uh, I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you. Uh, next, Councillor Rutley. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, the uh, this is no doubt, this is a beautiful looking development. My only disappointment is that it's not in Ward 2. Uh, but I'm sure, uh, um, Peter, we can uh, talk about that at a later date sometime. Um, but it, it, uh, the one thing about high rises and 84 units, um, that's probably 84 homes that are going to be freed up across the city or people moving from other cities, but I hope most of them come from our own city of Brantford. And that frees up homes for families, uh, married couples that have children. And um, that, you know, that uh, makes better use of space and, uh, uh, and allows people to uh, live their uh, quality lifestyles um, at certain times in their life. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Peter. Uh, and his team is not just Vicano, but um, Peter has a knack of uh, working with high quality um, consultants, um, expertise uh, to get the best possible quality uh, for his buildings, uh, whatever they may be for our community and, uh, and many other communities. So congratulations, Peter. I'll be very, very happy to support this. Thanks, Councillor Sluss. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd just like to congratulate the, the ward councillors and uh, and the residents that live in that area and, and the developer, because I think from what I've seen this evening, uh, what started out as something that uh, I wasn't particularly fond of uh, through discussion with the neighborhood and with the developer, with the uh, Ward councillors, uh, we came out the other end with a, a very nice looking building that uh, I think anybody would be happy to live by. So I, uh, I would congratulate all and, and, and I as well, am very pleased to support this. I think it's an excellent project. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Martin. Thank you. First, I'd like to, to thank the developer for the, the wonderful changes that they've made to this project. Uh, what we started with uh, certainly is, is different than what, where we ended up. Um, however, 
uh, being seven stories in a neighborhood with all single story, single detached homes, uh, like when I looked at the, the public area it, for public input, uh, there's in excess of 60 homes there. And I think there's one that's a story and a half. There isn't a single two story. It's all single story homes in that area. You got to expand that circle quite a ways to get uh, two two story homes and all the rest are single story. So I think it's too high for this neighborhood. And when the city first acquired this property, at the time I said it'd be a great spot for a branch library because the St. Paul branch is, is landlocked. There isn't sufficient parking there. And also the gym could have been used for a small theater space, which we're desperately looking for. So uh, I, think, I think parking is going to be an issue. Uh, as was talked about, uh, the one and a half uh, parking spaces per unit for a rental is more than enough. But for a high-end condo, I think it's going to be insufficient. And uh, they say they exceed the one and a half. Well, they exceed the one and a half by nine parking spots. And they're going to go quick. So uh, I know that uh, Councilor McCurry will, will support me when we bring in re recommendations to restrict parking on, on Wayne and Norman. Uh, because I think it is going to be a nightmare if uh, we don't put those restrictions on. So I, I won't be supporting this, but uh, if it does pass, I have no doubt it will be a, a, a nice looking building, but it's just too big for the neighborhood. Uh, Councilor McCurry. Mayor, thank you very much. And I'll mostly echo what my ward mate has said. Uh, I do want to commend Peter and the professional staffs with respect to the improvements they made over the uh, original building, which uh, left much to be desired as Councillor Celeste alluded to earlier. Um, they've been good partners in this. Uh, however, for the same reasons Councillor Martin has expressed, I won't be supporting this this evening. Uh, we've heard uh, quite a number of concerns in the neighborhood, uh, a lot of them relating to the, uh, the sheer size of the building. Uh, I would point out that um, the, um, the height's been increased from uh, the permitted five to seven stories here. Uh, but even at five stories, the neighborhood was going to have concerns. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I look at it, I look at it as dominating the landscape. Um, folks are um, just not happy in the neighborhood. There was an expectation that we'd be getting um, low rise condominiums, which the neighborhood would have been very accepting of. Um, Councillor Martin and I had an experience with a low rise condominium further down the street on Fairview Drive, uh, some rocky beginnings there, but um, it incorporated into the neighborhood very, very nicely after a period of time. I think the primary concern uh, that I have is, as have the neighbors relates to parking. Um, I think that uh, in all fairness, although they're marketing to seniors, I think what they're gonna get is commuters because it's uh, one block off 403 and uh, that's pretty doggone appealing to somebody that's uh, now driving an hour and a half to work every day and will save themselves 15 or 20 minutes by relocating to uh, uh, Uptown Bradford. Uh, so I think as Councillor Martin said, we're gonna end up with, uh, with, a, with a two per cars per, um, per household in this development. Uh, I was very pleased at the comment Councillor Carpenter made about the ability to restrict the amount of rentals in a building. And I think that's something that we'll certainly be looking at uh, as we go forward and we look forward to having that discussion. Uh, because uh, you know, as I said earlier, um, by some of the folks, they were also dreadfully concerned that we'd end up with rental units here, uh, which would have maybe given them some cause for concern with respect to their property values. I don't think that's at all um, on the radar with respect to what we've got currently, but I think we're gonna wanna make certain of that as well. So uh, much as I'd like to support this, um, as Councillor Martin has said, uh, we're supporting the immediate neighborhood. They have concerns, so we have concerns. and. Uh, Councillor Martin and I will be looking very much forward to participating in the site plan process as this goes forward. I think there are some improvements that can be made with respect to the site plan, uh, some tinkering that will probably lessen the impact that this has on uh, those uh, that are living in proximity. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Councillor Carpenter for a second time. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of points. Uh, the uh, I, I want to congratulate the 84 units is is makes the condominium corporation much more viable than if it was say 20 units or 15 units. Uh, uh, the 84 units will make the condominium corporation the payments that they make to the reserve fund uh, work very well and maintain the building in its in its 
original condition in perpetuity. But I'd like to direct staff to concerns that we, there was an issue with the with the with the uh, traffic. And I know that there's already an issue, a long-standing issue on Fairview Drive. You know, as you as you approach going westerly, you approach from from Norman or from um, Wayne, you approach to the access to 403, and then from there to the King George Road access, where the, the lanes are not wide enough to access the center lane that takes you through to Tollgate Road or the left and right turn lanes. They're, they're not delineated enough, far enough down to take the traffic flow, which causes a large backup problem on a regular basis and would even be blocking the fire hall. So I hopefully staff are, are looking at the, that particular issue as well as part of the transportation plan to certainly alleviate the traffic problems in that neighborhood. Thank you. You're on mute, Mayor. So not seeing any other raised hands, uh, Julie, would you please uh, take the vote, please? Item 5.1, application for official plan amendment OP0420 and zoning bylaw PZ 1520 for 34 Norman Street is approved on a recorded vote of seven to two. Those in favor, Mayor Davis, Councillors Weaver, Utley, Sless, Carpenter, Van Tilborg, and Wall. Those against, Councillors Martin and McCreary, uh, noting Councillor Antoski's pecuniary interest. Thank you, Julia. We'll now move into the regular agenda. Uh, there were uh, no registered delegations to speak to any of the items on the agenda tonight. And we've only had one item separated for discussion purposes. So, Councillor Antoski, if you please read the motion and name your seconder to get that item on the floor for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just pulling it up again. One moment, please. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Carp. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, my apologies, I had to go out of the email. That all items for consideration consent 7.1 and 7.2 separated for discussion purposes be approved. All right, thank you. So we do have the one item, which is 7.11, which is the Alfred Street, Arthur Street at Shallow Creek Park traffic control report. And I believe Councillor Wall has an amendment. So why don't you proceed to get the amendment on the floor, Councillor Wall? Can I speak to the original item first before I move my amendment? Well, you can do that, but you can you can speak to them combined if you want. Well, I just want to, I'm going I'm to speak if I may. Okay, why don't you, well, right. That's, go ahead, speak to the, um, Thank you, Chair the matter that's on the floor before we take your Thank amendment. You. Great. Um, so this one's a really important one to me. Um, if you heard me speak about it before, I'm really adamant about making sure that there's a way for children and family members and people to be able to get across Alfred Street and into Shallow Creek Park safely. That's the park that supports that whole neighborhood. Um, but since the original motion came, I've had many conversations with staff uh, and I've tried to speak with people in the community, but obviously COVID and things are weird right now. And at the end of the day, uh, we have come to the conclusion that perhaps a crosswalk is not merited at this immediate moment and that there might be a better way to go about doing it. Uh, so ultimately, I have not given up on my um, forward momentum in getting a crosswalk for that neighborhood. I just think that there might be a better way of going about it. And this is the first steps, uh, pardon the pun. So uh, I would like to move an amendment. I'm seeking a seconder. My ward mate, Councillor Van Tilburg. Thank you, sir. Uh, the amendment is as follows, that the posted speed limit of 40 kilometers be approved on Alfred Street adjacent to Shallow Creek Park, and B, that the necessary bylaw be presented to City Council for adoption. Uh, additionally, uh, following the installation of the maximum 40 kilometer an hour sign, I am making a formal request of staff to investigate the temporary installation of radar feedback signs uh, for public education about the new speed limit. Uh, 
And then I would also like staff to please investigate the signs that are already posted in the area that state that there is a playground ahead and warning signs uh, to ensure that they are all in good condition and visible. Um, and then finally, there is going to be a report coming back to council uh, regarding the slow down line so uh, lawn signs that Councillor Utley brought forward. Uh, and I would love it if maybe some members of that community were to put some signs up on the street for the time being. And then we will reinvestigate the need for a crosswalk at a later date. This conversation is not over. So thank you. And uh, I hope for council support on my motion to make Alfred Street a safer place for the neighborhood. Very good. So uh, anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Not seeing any raised hands. So. Julie, would you please take the vote on the amendment? The amendment to item 7.1.1 .1 is approved unanimously on a recorded vote. Those in favor, Mayor Davis, Councillors Weaver, Utley, Sless, McQuery, Martin, Carpenter, Antosky, Van Tilburg, and Wall. So any discussion on the motion as amended? Councillor Carpenter. Uh, I will support the motion as amended. I always support the ward councillors when they are supporting their ward constituents. And I always support my ward constituents when they tell me what they like as well. But uh, I think in the long term, this is going to need uh, a three-way stop sign and a crosswalk. Uh, that, that's inevitably where we're going. And uh, I will support the ward councils when they bring that back after the studies have been done. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, uh, Julie, please take the vote. Item 7.1.1 as amended is approved unanimously on a recorded vote. Those in favor, Mayor Davis, Councillors Weaver, Utley, Sless, McCurry, Martin, Carpenter, and Tosky, Van Tilburg, and Wall. All right, we'll move to resolutions. There is only one resolution, mine. So, Councillor Sless, would you mind taking the chair for a few minutes? Certainly, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you have a resolution. Would you like to move it? Yes, I would, please. Please go so, ahead. So I'm moving, seeking a seconder. Um, Councilor Carpenter, that, that's appropriate. You're my inspiration for this resolution. So whereas on November 24th, 2020, City Council reappointed myself to the Grand River Conservation Authority Board of Directors. And whereas members appointed to the Grand River Conservation Authority Board of Directors receive an honorarium for each meeting that we attend, and whereas section F1B of bylaw 81214 requires additional benefits from any board or committee to be paid over or redirect to the city. And whereas section 1FC of bylaw 81 2014 allows the honorarium paid to be redirected to a specific city account or otherwise by way of resolution adopted by a majority vote. And whereas um, my 2020 accumulated honorarium from the GRC has not been redirected by way of resolution. Now, therefore, be resolved the total value of Mary Davis's 2020 and 21 honorarium be held in count 01000.43660 be donated to the Brant United Way. And if I may, please, Mr. Acting Chair, uh, as I said previously, my, my inspiration for this uh, was what Councillor Carpenter did before Christmas, which I understand was very similar to what former Councillor David Newman did when he was serving on the GRCA. And so this is a payment that's uh, it's like it's a payment for services rendered, so to speak, to the GRCA uh, by virtue of our policy. As I said, we don't receive it personally. And I think it's entirely appropriate to be directed uh, to a charity of our choice. I've selected the Brant United Way as a previous chair of the Brant United Way campaign. It's served on the board of directors. And, and I'd say this generally, this is a really tough time for a lot of nonprofit organizations in our community. I encourage residents as much as possible uh, for those who are still working and, and have the ability to do it. 
to, to make a donation to the charity of your choice. Most of them are finding it very difficult, especially those who, who must uh, largely depend upon uh, charitable donations. And I'd select the Brain Aid away because they do support a number of different organizations through a common fundraising campaign. And they are also revising the way in which they distribute their money. They're now including an element that's focused on specific issues or challenges of community and not just necessarily to always the same group of charities. So they are uh, kind of reinventing themselves and, and updating their approach and policy. And uh, I've given my past history with them and what they're doing. I'm very pleased that uh, whatever is paid to me through my efforts working on behalf of GRC is, goes over to the Brand United Way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, speakers to the uh, resolution, I have Councillor Carpenter. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the recognition. I do appreciate that. Uh, I, I, and uh, it's, this is a, not a, a small donation because uh, it's the 2021 a cumulative amount of money, which is you know $140 a meeting times 12 meetings. I think we had a couple extra meetings there to deal with the, uh, the legislation by the province eliminating Grand River Conservation Authorities that uh, that funding We'll, we'll go there. So the, the United Way will have a, a, a good kick for that. I, that's very, I'm sure they're going to appreciate it. I know that uh, I donated mine to the Seniors Resource Center, and I think we also have uh, our police board honorariums. And I think, uh, if I recall, and certainly Councilor Martin will correct me if I'm wrong, that he donated his to the airport. So uh, we have uh, found ways to donate and help the community in this process. Uh, and I know that the Seniors Resource Center, the funding that they received, and they did receive it just before Christmas, in time to assist in the seniors in, in their in their community that they that they know of that need some assistance at Christmas time and that that was very much created and went to work to assist a lot of seniors in the community so thank you. Okay. Are there any further uh, discussion? Yes, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Um, I agree with this resolution completely. As as was mentioned, uh, I receive. Uh, credit for, for some of the committees that I sit on and I've redirected those to the airport. Some of the committees that we <laughs> sit on involve a very large amount of work and for the um, Grand River Conservation Authority, it means traveling out of town. And uh, because we don't get that extra pay, uh, I know I sit on the hydro board, which has a very long uh, meeting once a month and the police services board where I'm, I'm chairing the negotiations right now. So I'm very involved with that. So I think it's appropriate that the members that do that extra work get to direct where that honorarium get, gets directed within, within our, uh, our, the city, city, uh, city files. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the extra money to the airport for the committees that I sit on. And I fully support the, the mayor and, and his choice to have his honorariums go to the United Way. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, could you uh, please take the vote, Madam Clerk? Item 8.1, redirection of GRCA honorarium to Brant United Way is approved unanimously on a recorded vote. Those in favor, Mayor Davis, Councillor Weaver, Utley, Sluss, McCreary, Martin, Carpenter, Antoski, Van Tilburg, and Wall. I'll give it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sluss, for doing that for me. So we'll now move to, uh, I believe, notices of motion now. And there are two notices of motion for tonight's meeting. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, you've got the first one. If you please read the title. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's support for seniors advocacy bill, Bill 196. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sluss, you've got 9.2. Yes, Mr. Mayor, it's reconsideration of an amendment to uh, the official plan. All right, thank you. Now, just before we conclude the meeting, I had failed to do this previously. I assume members won't mind this, but uh, wondering if uh, Mr. Brian Hutchings might just uh, uh, address us and the community. He attended a meeting in the middle of the day with all other CEOs of large municipalities across Ontario that uh, met with provincial officials to discuss the recent measures that have been taken. So he, of all of us, probably has more direct knowledge of uh, uh, what is happening right now. And he has asked if he could just take a few minutes to, to address the committee and also our community. So, Mr. Hutchings, if you're there, you are. So, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Your Worship, and uh, 
to you, to the committee, and to the, to the public. Uh, I'm not going to repeat my report, which was not separated, or repeat your earlier comments. And but as you know, uh, for the community, that uh, today uh, Ontario Premier Doug Ford announced that under 7.0.1 of the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, that it'll take effect immediately. But on uh, January 14, 2021, so tomorrow night at 12:12:01 a.m., a stay-at-home order comes into effect. It means everyone in Ontario will uh, need to remain home, with the exception of essential purposes, i.e. trips to grocery store or pharmacy, accessing health care or, or, or health care for exercise or essential work. Individuals are now required to wear a mask or face covering in indoor areas or business or organizations that are open. And, in, and this is important for us as a city. New enforcement measures are set to allow provincial offenses officers, including police, Municipal bylaw officers and First Nation constables to issue tickets for individuals, employees, or corporations who do not comply with the stay-at-home stay order. Essentially, if people are not wearing a mask within a uh, business, they will be ticketed. The business won't be, but the, 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 they, they will be. Uh, and as well, Mr. Mayor, uh, our child care operations will remain open and our we have 56 spots open and 24 being used at the moment for essential workers in our community that are doing uh, amazing work for our community and our and supporting people, these healthcare workers and essential workers. Uh, the province has also updated the essential business list. And for more information, uh, residents can look at the Stop the Spread business information line. Um, moving forth, our EOC will be meeting tomorrow, uh, the city EOC, and they'll be discussing city operations as well as city uh, compliance, our enforcement group and education group and our bylaw group as well as our staff's health and safety and how we communicate out all these changes to city operations. After that, we'll be meeting with the joint EOC, which is comprised of the health units, as well as the, the two police forces, the uh, County of Branch, Six Nations, the two school boards, and a number of other community partners. To talk what this means to the region of the area of Brantford Branch and Six Nations, and how we can support one another in these efforts and support, uh, and, and especially support the hospital and the health unit during these times. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Your Worship, I will have uh, more details tomorrow off the EOC to Council and uh, within the next few weeks to, the, to uh, the Council meeting on January 26th, how this will affect our operations, uh, this recent uh, announcement under the Emergency Protection and, uh, Act, which is in effect for the next 14 days and can be renewed for another 14 days. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Hutchings. And I tell members of the public, Serena City City's Communication Department will be doing a lot of communicating uh, through the city's Facebook site, the city's website. Please consult them. All the individual members of council on their various uh, social media feeds, uh, myself included, will obviously be doing the same thing through the week. Uh, we, I think we all sincerely, I think I'd be speaking on behalf of the council. You know, we're facing trying times. Let's work together. Let's do the things we've been asked to do. And now more than being asked, we're being directed. Um, uh, we'll get through this, but let's be let's be safe. Let's be smart. Let's do our part. Thank you very much. For in terms of what's coming up, we do have a meeting next Tuesday. It's a committee of the whole, a special meeting dealing with the official plan. Uh, try and finalize that process, and then the week following that, there will be a city council meeting at the normal time. And at that time, I hope, so long as I'm unaffected by the first thing by the COVID epidemic pandemic uh, that uh, I will be doing a sort of a modified address uh, to the community and to this council, really talking about some of our experiences last year and uh, what we hope to accomplish over the, the balance of our term. So much more to come. Thank you.